Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive it. We thank you for all that you bring forth this night. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of the message tonight is, Church, Why Have You Misunderstood the Doctrine of the Holy Spirit? This is addressed to the church worldwide because we do not have unity on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. It should never have happened. So that's the question we pose to the church. Why have you misunderstood the doctrine of the Holy Spirit? And they have misunderstood it, as you will see. We see that Acts 2.1 was on the day of Pentecost, was fully come. They were all with one accord in one place. That's when the, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on this day, began the birthday of the church, of those who are living to be born again, as we talked about today. And we spent time talking about understanding the Feast of Pentecost. Now, the reason why we say this, have you misunderstood the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, is because there are all these different doctrinal teachings, and they're all wrong but one at best, and what we see in most all circles is there's error across the board. Well, God is going to raise up His mighty, perfected, glorious church, and if so, they're going to come to the place of perfection and come to the place of being one, and certainly they're going to have things straight on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. It should be. We'll be looking at the writings that John wrote. He didn't have; he had things straight about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Paul, who got much of the revelation of the New Testament, he had the doctrine of the Holy Spirit straight. Of course, Jesus had the doctrine of the Holy Spirit straight. If we would just look at the Word of God and rightly divide the Word of Truth by looking at all the Scriptures and seeing what they say, we should not have, nobody should have misunderstood this, and we should be in one accord in the church world today about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. What we see is this. There is one group that thinks that you get the Holy Spirit comes into you when you're born again. There is another group that says that, well, you get the Holy Spirit after you're born again. And they call it by all kinds of different names. Then there's others that will say that, you, well, you get the Holy Spirit when you're born again. But then there is something further, a, what they call a baptism of the Holy Spirit, which occurs after that, like an endowment of power that comes upon you. And these people mostly refer to this particular experience that we're mentioning as a baptism of the Holy Spirit. They often will call it being filled with the Holy Spirit. These are common phrases, especially among full gospel, Pentecostal, charismatic type believers. Now, they also occasionally will refer to it as receiving the Holy Spirit, but primarily baptism of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit. So they say, have you been baptized with the Holy Spirit since you became a Christian? Or have you been filled with the Holy Spirit since you became a Christian? And this brings great confusion in the body of Christ because it's all error. It's not true whatsoever. And you're going to see that. I trust if you've never heard this message before, you're going to be open and teachable and you will learn the true doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Can we know it? Absolutely. The Holy Spirit, as we see in John 16, verse 13, <clears throat> here's the promise to us. Howbeit when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. We can know the truth. The Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. There's no excuse for us not having the truth and there's only one truth. Now, regarding the subject of the, of the Holy Spirit, in order to find out what the Word says about the true doctrine, we've got to look at all the Scriptures. We can't just look at a Scripture or two, and we can't make assumptions about what we think it means. We have to look at it specifically 
and see what it really means. And that's so important. We're going to begin looking in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 31. Exodus 31. We pick up in verse 5 here, or verse 3. Speaking of here, of the one involved in constructing the tabernacle, his name was Bezalel. Verse 3, I have filled him with the Spirit of God. Stop right there. This is the Old Testament. He was filled with the Spirit of God. Well, many people would say, well, you couldn't be filled with the Holy Spirit until you, the New Testament era. Well, this destroys that teaching right now. I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and knowledge and all manner of workmanship. What would that be for? For the purpose of service, the service of the Lord in the construction of the tabernacle. That even tells you what the filling of the Holy Spirit's all about. It has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit coming into you. It has nothing to do with you having a power of God upon you. It's all about the service of the Lord for the influence of the Holy Spirit to serve the Lord. Here's another place in the actual, in the Old Testament era. Luke chapter 1, verse 13. Here's where the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, thy prayers heard, that Elizabeth shall bear a son, shall call his name John, of joy and gladness, many shall rejoice at his birth. He shall be great in the sight of the Lord, shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. This is speaking about John the Baptist. In the time when he was born, had Jesus come on the scene? No. Had the redemption been accomplished? No. Could anybody have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them before the redemption was accomplished? No. Yet he was filled with the Holy Ghost from the mother's womb. Well, what was the purpose for? Because of the ministry that he was going to carry out, the service of the Lord. What does that tell you? The filling of the Holy Spirit occurred again before anybody was born again. In the Old Testament era, which really this still was, before Jesus accomplished the redemption. And notice here, he was filled with the Holy Ghost for the influence of the service of the Lord for the prophet's ministry. Look at verse 41. <clears throat> it came to pass when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Was she born again? No, not yet. And what did she do? She spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb. She began to prophesy. That meant the fact that this is the service of the Lord, a filling of the Holy Spirit came for her to speak a prophecy into being. We come to verse 67. His father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, and begins to speak the things that he said. Notice, he was filled with the Holy Ghost and then prophesied. Well, that tells you again, this is all before any of these ones were born again. The filling of the Holy Spirit occurred in the Old Testament era. It has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in you or some special uh, um, doom of power upon you whatsoever. It all has to do with the service of the Lord as we see in each one of these cases. And it happened in the Old Testament era. Now, the, if you have thought that the filling of the Holy Spirit is something that people get after they're born again, this has obviously destroyed your belief right now. The truth is, the filling of the Holy Spirit occurred in the Old Testament era, and it occurred in the New Testament era, which you will see as we get to those scriptures. Now, let's look at the teaching, first of all, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, here is where John says something. 
He says, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me, speaking of Jesus, is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, this is talking about a baptism of the Holy Ghost. Well, that's something different from that filling of the Holy Ghost that we saw earlier. They are different. Most people, full gospel people, have said the baptism of the Holy Spirit, filling, being filled with the Holy Spirit, they think of it as the same thing. It's not. Great error because they have not understood that they are different. And here he's talking about a baptism of the Holy Ghost. And with is added by the translator, by the way, and fire. Meaning that when the baptism of the Holy Spirit occurred, also fire would be involved doing something. And what does fire do? It burns things up and consumes things, which you'll find out when we discuss this a little bit later. It's also important to understand that this baptism with water under repentance that they were talking about, this is what was the first step into the priesthood in the Old Testament. And he's now saying there's going to be some, another way of coming into the priesthood because of the prophecy of Exodus 19, verse 5 and 6, that they were all going to be a kingdom of priests, all the Israelites. And here it's speaking about how that was going to happen. But there was going to be a new way of baptism, not with water, but now a baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire, which was going to bring them into the priesthood. So this is a change from a washing of the water to now a baptism by the Holy Spirit. We see another scripture over in John, chapter 7. So we see this term, baptism of the Holy Spirit, now appearing. We come down to verse 37. John 7, 37. Last day, great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of the living water. This spake ye of the Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit, which they that believe on him, so this would be believers, should receive, this is the word lambano, receiving the Holy Spirit. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So this is talking about something different. We've seen the filling of the Holy Spirit. We've seen a baptism of the Holy Spirit. We've seen now here about a receiving of the Holy Spirit. And who does? A, someone who believes on him. And it furthermore says the Holy Ghost wasn't given yet. Well, that meant that this receiving couldn't happen yet. Why was that? Because Jesus was not yet glorified. Well, Jesus was glorified when he was seated at the right hand of the Father. So that means the receiving of the Holy Spirit could not happen until after Jesus was glorified at the right hand of the Father and having accomplished the redemption. Well, by the way, when was Jesus glorified? We mentioned this is after he'd accomplished the redemption, and here we see it in Acts 2.33, look what it says. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received the, of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. Having received, lambano, taken, received of the Father this promise of the Holy Ghost. This is the receiving of the Holy Spirit, and where did Jesus get it from? From the Father. And when did he get it? after he was glorified at the right hand of God, exalted. So that means the receiving of the Holy Spirit that he said for, sent forth, it says, you now see and hear. Well, that didn't occur until after Jesus had been gone back to heaven and was seated at the right hand of the Father. Let's go over to John 14. In John 14, we pick up in verse 16. Jesus prays and he says, I will pray the Father. He shall give you, so who's going to be giving this? The Father. Another comforter that he may abide with you forever. What's this comforter? Verse 17. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot 
receive. This is this Greek word lambano again. Remember we've seen the terms baptism of the Holy Spirit, filling of the Holy Spirit, receiving of the Holy Spirit. Here, the Spirit of Truth is the Holy Spirit. And notice it says the world cannot receive it. Meaning the receiving of the Holy Spirit cannot be done by someone who is, is of the world. Because remember it said it was only by those who believed on him, believers. So again, that makes it very clear. The receiving of the Holy Spirit cannot be done by an unbeliever. It can only be done by a believer. It says, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. <clears throat> that also tells you something. The Holy Spirit was dwelling with them in the Old Testament era, but he wasn't, coming, wasn't dwelling in them yet. Shall be in you. That would be when they would receive the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in them at a later time. Let's go down to verse 26 as we look at the teaching. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. So where is the Holy Spirit coming from? The Father. The Father is going to send him in my name. He will teach you all things, bring all things to remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Then we come to chapter 15, and we pick up in verse 26. When the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father. So that means Jesus is involved in sending the Holy Spirit. It said the Father was going to send him, but here he says, I will send unto you from the Father, which means... It must come from the Father to Jesus who sends it in the earth. And that's the way the, God, the command of God goes. And the chain of command from the Father to the Son. So Jesus got the Holy Spirit from the Father and sent it into the earth. Even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father. So where does the Holy Spirit come from? It comes from the Father. That is important to understand. The Holy Spirit does not come from Jesus. He got it from the Father and sent it into the earth. So, that tells us the fact that Jesus got it. And when did he, when did he get it from the Father? Remember what we just saw in Acts chapter 2, verse 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost. He got it from the Father when he was at the right hand exalted. He shed forth this which you now see and hear. Furthermore, we know this means that Jesus couldn't get the Holy Spirit until after he'd gone back to heaven. We see this declared as well in John 16:7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. Because he had to go to heaven, receive it of the Father, and then send it into the earth. But if I depart, I will send him unto you, which is what had happened after he received of the Father. And this is all talking about the receiving of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit was going to come. Remember, he was receiving this promise of the Father being sent into the earth. Now, that brings us to another scripture that we have to address. Because all the scriptures fit together like pieces in a jug seal, jigsaw puzzle, and they're all true, and none of them contradict each other. That's important to understand. John 20, verse 22. This is before Jesus went back and was exalted at the right hand of the Father where he received the promise of the, from the Father and sent it into the earth. So he didn't have the Holy Spirit to send in the earth yet. But this is prior to that. This is at when he was revealing himself to the disciples over 40 days. John 20, verse 22. When he had said this, he breathed on him and said to him, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. This is this word, lambano. Take the Holy Spirit. What is this all talking about? Well, let's look at the context. Verse 19. Same day at evening, being the first day of the week, doors were shut, disciples were 
assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. He showed him his hands and his side. Disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And he said, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so I send I you. And then he said, Receive you the Holy Ghost. There have been so, so many people, unfortunately, that have taught that this is where the Holy Spirit came into them and dwelt in them. Not so. Why? Because it couldn't happen, remember, until he was exalted at the right hand of the Father. Sounds like a contradiction, but it's not. How do we know? Because what, is, what happened when there, there was a receiving of the Holy Ghost, but what happened? Was it for the Holy Spirit to come to dwell in us? No. You have to look at the parallel context. Luke chapter 24. Let's look at verse 36. Here's where Jesus stood in the midst of them and said, Peace be unto you. So you can see it's the same context. Verse 39, Behold my hands and feet, it's I myself, handle me and see. So again, where he's revealing the same context. When he had thus spoken, showed him his hands and his feet, as we see. And then we come down to verse 44. He said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding, this is actually the word nous, meaning mind. It means mind, not understanding. It's really a mistake here. 24 times nous has been used, translated correctly, 21 times mind. Erroneously, understanding three. The reason why you even know that this is not correct, because, look at this, he opened their minds, noose, as we pointed out, that they might understand the scriptures. This is the word for understanding, sunayami. And this, as we see from the usage, 26 times have been translated understand, 24 correctly. So, we can't have noose here and then tsunami over here. They aren't the same word. They mean different. Young's didn't even pick up on this, unfortunately. What this literally says, he opened their minds that they might understand the scriptures. Well, how did they open their minds? In the parallel passage back in John chapter 20, we see exactly what happened. In verse 22, it says that he said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost when he breathed on him. And so when he did that, then he began to reveal the scriptures about him that were written in Moses and the Psalms and the prophets, as he said. Because the Holy Spirit brought the revelation and said, What did it do? It wasn't a receiving to come and dwell in them. It was a receiving in their mind to open their minds so they could understand the scriptures. So, this is not talking about the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in us. This is simply the Holy Spirit revealing in their mind what the scriptures meant so they would understand the scriptures written about him. Furthermore, we know that the promise of the Father hadn't come yet because we were just in Luke 24. And we come down further in Luke 24 to verse 49. He says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Jesus is going to send it. Where did he get it from? From the Father, as we saw, after he was in heaven. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. What, why would they have to wait till t in Jerusalem? Because the Holy Spirit hadn't been poured out until the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. That's after he had received the Holy Spirit, the promise of the from the Father, and sent it into the earth. So, the point being is that the Holy Spirit was not received until after Jesus had received it from the Father, having been exalted at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Now, let's go back to Acts 1 now for a moment, as we've looked at many scriptures. Acts 1, 4, being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, 
Remember, he's waiting for this promise of the Father. Wait for the promise of the Father, which saith thee, You have heard of me. For John truly baptizeth water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. Now, we come back to this speaking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So, as we have talked about this, we've seen three different terms that are significant. The filling of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the receiving of the Holy Spirit. We saw that the filling of the Holy Spirit occurred in the Old Testament era for service, has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in you. It has nothing to do with like an empowerment coming upon you as people have thought in the New Testament. Then we talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We know that that had to do with coming into the priesthood and we know that it's from the change from baptism with water now to baptism by the Holy Spirit. This is a new one and this hadn't happened yet. They said it's going to happen a few, it meant not many days hence, which means it would happen at the time of the day of Pentecost. So it hadn't happened prior to that. So it's obviously different from the filling of the Holy Spirit, which happened in the Old Testament era. And then we have the receiving of the Holy Spirit, which we saw the receiving of the Holy Spirit is for believers, as we pointed out, after they are born again. The world can't receive the Holy Spirit, remember. Only believers could receive the Holy Spirit. And that's another term. So we have the filling of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the receiving of the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, full gospel, Pentecostal, charismatic, Type believers have called this, this, all three of these, the same experience. Primarily, they have said, have you been baptized with the Holy Spirit since you've been born again? Or, secondly, they'll usually call it, have you been filled with the Holy Spirit after you're born again? And a few will call it, have you received the Holy Spirit after you've been born again? They're referring to all the same experience thinking that it is something after you are born again. It is all error. We're going to look at this and explain this to you clearly tonight because we should not have misunderstood the doctrine of the Holy Spirit if we looked at it clearly. Obviously, you know the filling of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and receiving, they're all different from what we've already seen. So, we begin with the subject of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 3, verse 11. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. We saw this earlier, and, and fire. Baptism is a word, baptizo, meaning it's an untranslated Greek word. They just made an English word out of it, baptize. What does it mean? It means to immerse, to submerge, or to engulf in something. So if I have some water here and I take my hand and stick my hand down in the water, my hand would be immersed, submerged, and engulfed in the water. That is what baptism means. Of course, we know that if a person is baptized in water, they go down in the water, the water engulfs them around, they're submerged in the water. That is what baptism is about. So if we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it would be the same thing. The submerging, the immersing, or engulfing in the presence of the Holy Spirit. This just tells you that it's going to happen. And we know this has to do with coming into the priesthood. It does speak about fire having some involvement, which we will comment on shortly. Here's the second use, because there's seven uses of this clearly shown. First, we'll look at Mark 1.8. I have indeed baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Uh, same thing over in Luke chapter 3, verse 16. John answered, saying to them, I indeed baptize you with water, but one cometh mightily, mightier than I cometh, the latch of whose shoes I'm not worthy to loose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So here again, similar to Matthew 3, 11. And then we see in another case, over in John chapter 1, 
in verse 33. Here is where, who, who you see the Spirit ascending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And so who's going to be doing the baptizing with the Holy Spirit? It's Jesus who's doing it. He's the one who's sending the Holy Spirit into the earth, remember. Now all four of these are telling you that Jesus is going to do it, but they really don't tell you what it is, what happens when it occurs. Here's the fifth use, which we already looked at. Acts 1, verse 4 and 5. Remember he said, wait for the promise of the Father. John truly baptized with water. You shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So that tells us when this was going to occur on the day of Pentecost, but it still doesn't tell us what actually it is yet. We see a case in Acts chapter 11 where it uses this, and this is Paul, uh, Peter rehearsing what happened at Cornelius' house when the gospel came to them. In Acts chapter 11, verse 14, here it speaks about Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. So what was Peter doing? He was coming and preaching the gospel to those at Cornelius' house to be saved, to be born again. Read on. As I began to speak, what's he speaking? Words about being saved. The Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptizeth water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. So how did the Holy Spirit fall upon them at the beginning? It was a baptism of the Holy Ghost. And what was he saying? The same thing that happened to them at the beginning happened again here at Cornelius' house when he told them words whereby he might be saved. The Holy Spirit fell upon them and uh, that they were being baptized with the Holy Spirit, which is what happened when they got born again, when they were told words that they might be saved. So this reveals, number one, when did the baptism of the Holy Spirit initially occur? It was on the day of Pentecost. He's referring back to what happened to them, which we know. Secondly, what did it do? It produced the new born again experience because he was telling them words whereby they might be saved. So they got saved. And what happens in a person, when, this ha when does this happen to a person? Well, we know when a person receives Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, that's when they get saved. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit occurs when a person receives Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, gets born again, and that is when he comes into relationship with the Father. Can we see a scripture that really clearly shows us what this actually says it straightforward, what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is? Yes, we can. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. Look what it says. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, we've been all made to drink into one Spirit. Notice this. For by one Spirit we're all baptized into one body. So this is the baptism by the Holy Spirit. What does it bring us into? One body. When do we come into the body of Christ? When we are born again. So when does this occur, this baptism of the Holy Spirit? It would be when someone receives Jesus as Lord and Savior. What does it produce? It produces a new creation in us. We come into the one body. It means we're born again. Now we have the Spirit of Jesus Christ. We're a new creation on the inside of us. What actually happens in the realm of the Spirit when this occurs? Well, remember what the word baptism means? It means to immerse, submerge, engulf. Meaning that when we receive Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, we are immersed, submerged, and engulfed in the presence of the Holy Spirit. The old spirit is taken out, and a brand new spirit is put in by the Holy Spirit which is what happens when we receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior and we are born again. The baptism of the Holy Spirit produces the new birth according to the Word of God.
That means that is the initial experience whereby we come into relationship with God, the Father. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the new birth. That is important to realize. We can even see another thing because when we get born again, what happens? We receive Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. So since that's the new birth and that's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit produces, what spirit do we get? Well, the scripture is clear. In Galatians 4, verse 6, Look what it says. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Meaning I'm now in relationship with God as my heavenly Father. What spirit did I get? The spirit of his son, it says. What is that? That's the spirit of Jesus Christ. The spirit of Christ, to be in Christ. So what do we get when we're born again? We receive Jesus, we get a brand new spirit, we receive the spirit of Jesus Christ. This is what's referred to in Galatians 3, 27, when it says, For as many as you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. What baptism is he talking about? Not water baptism. He's talking about baptism by the Holy Spirit that brought us into Christ. Remember, by one spirit we brought into one body, come into the body of Christ. That's how you have put on Christ. You now have the spirit of Jesus Christ in you. This is talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In Romans chapter 6, verse 3, Know ye not to as many as of you were baptized into Jesus Christ, talking about when you got born again, a spiritual baptism, were baptized into his death. Because what happened when, we, when Jesus baptized into his death, what happened? The old spirit was taken out and a new spirit came in. That's what happens at the new birth. The same thing happened to us. The old spirit was taken out and the new spirit came in on the inside of us. Remember what it talked about back in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11? The baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is when we get born again, and fire. Well, what's the fire do? Remember that when we receive Jesus, we get a brand new spirit. What happens to the old spirit? The fire burns it up and eliminates it. It is eliminated. So the old spirit is burned up and eliminated and a brand new spirit comes on the inside of us. This is actually shown and referred to in Romans chapter 5, verse 10. If when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, the word reconciled is the word katalaso, meaning the change or the exchange. There's an exchange that takes place when you get born again. The old spirit taken out. New spirit of Jesus Christ, the spirit of his son, comes into you. He goes on and says, much more being reconciled, the same thing, we should be saved by his life. Not only so, we also join God our, through our Lord Jesus Christ. By now we have received Lombano, which is to take what? What do we do? We take Jesus as our Savior. We take the exchange. Atonement is the word katalage, which means exchange. We took the exchange when we got a brand new spirit receiving Jesus. The old spirit's taken out. Fire burns it up. A brand new spirit comes on the inside of us. We see a statement made also in Romans chapter 8, verse 9. The latter part says, Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. This is differentiating this from the spirit of God, which is the Holy Spirit. Look what it says. You're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. That would be the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. He doesn't even belong to him. Because what do we get first? The Spirit of Christ that comes from him. 
the Spirit of Christ is not the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Christ is the Spirit of His Son that proceeds from Jesus when we receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. That is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that's what happens when we get born again. That is so important to understand. You also must understand about baptisms for a moment. There is a water baptism and there is a spiritual baptism of the Holy Spirit. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 2 says, And of the doctrine of baptisms, it is plural in the Greek. There is a, doctor, a doctrine or teaching of baptisms because there is the baptism of the Holy Spirit and there's also the baptism of water. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the spiritual baptism that brings you into the body of Christ. Baptism of water is a declaration of what happened on the inside of you already, declaring to the world that you've come into the priesthood, you're born again, you belong to him, and you're through with the world. It does not bring forth a new creation within you. What brings the new creation is when you receive Jesus. And that's where the Holy Spirit engulfs you, takes the old spirit out, and a brand new spirit comes into you. There is only one spiritual baptism, by the way, and we can see this from Ephesians 4, verse 5. One Lord, one faith, and it's interesting, the word one is this word heis, if you notice, the general word for one. One faith, it uses heis again. There's a different word used when we come to one baptism. So there's no confusion. This is the word mia, which means only one, referring to only one spiritual baptism. It's used to make you know that there aren't two different spiritual baptisms. There's only one. And it's the baptism by the Holy Spirit that brought us into the body of Christ. So, let's go back to Acts 2 for a moment and see if we can see this happening on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they're all with one accord in one place. Remember, the first thing he said was the baptism of the Holy Spirit's going to occur. Remember what baptism means? Immerse, submerge, engulf in. Look at verse 2. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. It filled the whole place. Well, if the sound from heaven, which is the Holy Spirit, came like a mighty wind and filled the house where you are sitting or filled this place here where we are, if it filled the place, we would all be immersed, submerged, and engulfed in the presence of the Holy Spirit. That is the baptism of the Holy Spirit occurring. And what happens then? They got born again. Remember, Peter referred to this when he was rehearsing what happened at Cornelius' house. He remembered same thing happened to them. They got baptized with the Holy Spirit when he told the same, that they got saved, they got born again. Same thing happened with Cornelius when he told them words whereby thy mountain you might be saved. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit occurred when they got born again. So this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now the second term we're going to talk about is receiving the Holy Spirit. And to understand this, we do need to go back and look at a prophecy that was given by Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 and 27. Verse 26 says, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I'll give you a heart of flesh. This is prophesying what happens when a person gets born again. We get a new spirit and we get a new heart. The new spirit that we get is the spirit of Jesus Christ that proceeds from Jesus by receiving him as personal Lord and Savior. Verse 27 goes on and says, And I will put my spirit within you. Well, this is a different spirit. This isn't the a new spirit of verse 26. This is the my spirit. 
And this is the Father speaking, and this is the Spirit that comes from the Father, which is the Holy Spirit. And notice, he says, I'm going to put him within you. Before, he was just going to give them a new spirit, which is what we get when we get born again. We get a brand new spirit. But once we have a brand new spirit, now we're to get the my spirit put within us, which is the receiving of the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in us and cause you to walk in my statutes, keep my judgments and do them. You'll see that this is the receiving of the Holy Spirit. Now let's look at this term, receiving of the Holy Spirit through the word. John chapter 7. We already saw this earlier, but we want to look at it again. Verse 37, 38, he talks about, He that believeth on me, the scripture says, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Verse 39, this spake ye of the Spirit, that they that believe on him, this is believers who are born again, should receive the Greek word lambano, meaning they take hold of it, take it into them. And remember, the Holy Ghost is not yet given, but that Jesus is not yet glorified. So this is talking about receiving the Holy Spirit, which could only occur after Jesus was glorified, as we pointed out. But the point is, this is the receiving of the Holy Spirit. And what is this synonymous with? He's talking about coming unto them and drinking. Remember we had this pail of water. I stick my hand down in it. It immersed, submerged, engulfed it. But the water didn't get into me. Suppose I took the same water and drank it. The water would get into me. Drinking, drinking in Scripture is synonymous with taking something inside of you. So when he's talking about drinking... It's bringing something into you, and that's why he says, this is talking about the Holy Spirit. Those who believe in him should receive, take it into them, drink it into them to come to dwell in them. Receiving the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in us. And remember what we saw in John chapter 14, verse 17 before. Even the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot lambano, receive. Same Greek word. The world can't take the Holy Spirit into them. Why? Because they're not born again yet. The Holy Spirit is holy. will only come and dwell on a spirit that's right with God. That's why, what's the first thing we have to do? We have to get rid of the old spirit and get a new spirit, the Spirit of Christ. So, we get born again. The old spirit gets burned up, and we get the spirit of Christ, the spirit of his Son. We're now in relationship with God as our Heavenly Father. Then we can receive the Holy Spirit. Look over in 1 Corinthians, where we saw about the baptism of the Holy Spirit being the new birth. Verse 13, For by one spirit are we all baptized in one body. And look at the last part. It says, we've been all been made to drink into one spirit. This is not quite an accurate translation because this particular word means to give to drink. We have all been given to drink into one spirit. That's what it means, give to drink, give drink. It's always talking about something to have where you're giving to drink in some manner. So, that means now we've been given to drink into one spirit, meaning you and I can do it. How? That's what happens when we receive the Holy Spirit. We take the Holy Spirit. Remember, that's the drinking, the Holy Spirit coming to dwell on the inside of us. Now, let's look at scriptures in the, old, in the book of Acts that mention about this. First, let's look at Acts 2. 38 for a moment, just a portion of this, where it says, uh, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Receive, lambano, the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is talking about the receiving of the Holy Spirit. And when does this happen? This happens after we are born again. The receiving of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 8. Here is where, in verse 5, Philip goes to the city of Samaria, preaches Christ to them. The people with one accord gave heed to the things that Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles he did. Verse 17, 
excuse me, verse 12, when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women. This is talking about water baptism. So these guys were born again, they got the spirit of Jesus Christ, and they were now baptized. How about the Holy Spirit? Did the Holy Spirit come into them yet? No. How do we know? Read on. We go on here in verse 14. When the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive lambano, the same word, consistent, receive the Holy Spirit. Read on. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So these guys at Samaria, which had received the word, the Christ had been preached to them by Philip, they'd been born again, and they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. But the Holy Spirit had not come upon them, has not fallen upon any of them. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received, again, the same term, always received the Holy Spirit the Holy Ghost. We see also Acts 19. Acts 19, Paul found some disciples at Ephesus. Verse 2, he said to them, Have you received, Lombano, the Holy Ghost since you believed? They were believers. They hadn't received the Holy Spirit yet. Why would he ask them if, about receiving the Holy Spirit since you believed if they had already got the Holy Spirit when they believed. No, they didn't. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Otherwise, you're a believer, you're born again, you got the Spirit of Christ. Have you now received the Holy Spirit? Well, what was their answer? They said to him, we've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. They didn't even know about it. He proceeded to minister the Holy Spirit to them. In verse 6, Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them. That's the Holy Spirit being received. And they spake with tongues and prophesied, which is what you can do once you have the Holy Spirit within. Over in Ephesians, remember he was talking to those at Ephesus. Look what it says in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Well, let's stop and look at this again. They trusted in the word of truth that they heard. That was the gospel of their salvation. They heard words about being saved. They received Jesus, they got born again. They got the spirit of Jesus Christ. In whom also after that you believed, so they already were born again. This followed that. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. In fact, what do they call the Holy Spirit there? A promise. When do you have a right to the promises? If you're not born again and you're in the world, do you have a right to the promises of God? No. You have a right to the promises when you come into covenant relationship with Him. When do you come into covenant relationship with Him? When you get born again, born from above, you receive Jesus and you get a brand new spirit. So that means that once you have a new spirit on the inside of you and you're in covenant relationship, now you have a right to the promises. And what's, what's one of the promises? The Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit is a promise for those who are in covenant relationship with God. Also, which is the earnest or the first fruit, like money in a deposit for a house or something, purchase of something, first fruit of our inheritance, so the Holy Spirit's not only a promise, but it's the first part of our inheritance. This is why when you get someone born again, you should also immediately take them into receiving the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't come into them immediately. Remember, they only get the Spirit of Christ. Then they are to receive the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is a promise, and it is part of our inheritance, and that's important. And also, remember, who does it come from? Who do we receive it from? Luke 11, verse 13. If ye then, be an evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? 
So, notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say how much more will God give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. No, it says how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. What does that mean? That means that the person approaching God has a relationship to him as his heavenly Father, which means he's already a born-again child of God. So a born-again child of God is coming to his Father because he's born again, so he's got the Spirit of Christ in him, to, for, for the Father to give him the Holy Spirit. Well, why would he be coming for that? Because he doesn't have the Holy Spirit yet. The Holy Spirit is received after you're born again. That's why you have two spirits in you. If you have been born again, you've got the Spirit of Christ. Then you have the Holy Spirit who comes and dwells in you as well. You have both within you. That is important to realize. In Luke chapter 5, verse 37, look at this. No man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. New wine in Scripture is a type of the Holy Spirit. The bottle is a type of a person's spirit. Can we take the new wine, the Holy Spirit, and put it into an old spirit that is not right with God? No. What we'll do, it'll burst it, because the Holy Spirit's holy, and he's not going to come and dwell in a spirit that's not right with God. What's going, to ha what's going to be the answer? The new wine, type of the Holy Spirit, must be put into new bottles. So what's the answer? Get a new bottle, which is what happens when we get born again. We get a brand new spirit. We get the spirit of his son, spirit of Jesus Christ. Then the new wine, the Holy Spirit, can be put into the new bottle. So we get born again first, and then we have received the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in us. This is the same thing that's referred to in other places. It's always using this term, receive. In Galatians 3.2, this what I learn of you, received, lambano, the Spirit, by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. No, they received the Holy Spirit by the hearing of faith. Talking about receiving the Holy Spirit coming into us. Verse 14 that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive, lambano, the promise of the Spirit, remember it's a promise, through faith. Well, when are we come into faith? It's after we're born again, and we're in Christ now, and we have a right to the promises. So we receive the Holy Spirit, this promise of the Holy Spirit through our faith. Again, the same thing is clear. So, we now see that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the new birth, whereby an old spirit is taken out, burn up, and a new spirit comes into us, having been immersed in the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's when we get the spirit of Jesus Christ, the spirit of his, of his Son. We saw that is what happened in Acts chapter 2, verse 2. The rushing mighty wind filled the house where they were sitting. They got that's baptism of the Holy Spirit. They got born again. Secondly, there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. Just like when Paul ministered the Holy Spirit to them in Acts 19, 6, the Holy Spirit came on them, or in this case, it sat on each of them. That's the receiving of the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in them, which would have been after they're born again. Now they receive the Holy Spirit to dwell in them. The third thing that happened is they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Because they had the Holy Spirit within them, they had the ability to speak with other tongues from the Holy Spirit dwelling in them that gave them this language, which is a language of the Spirit. It could be other earthly tongues or angelic tongues. It is a spiritual prayer language that everybody can speak forth once you have the Holy Spirit within you. And this brought a filling of the Holy Spirit for the influence of the Holy Spirit for the service of the Lord, which we talked about. Now, let's talk about this filling of the Holy Spirit. 
We already saw in the Old Testament, Exodus 31, Bezalel was filled with the Spirit for the construction of the tabernacle. We saw John the Baptist filled with the Spirit from his mother's womb for the service of the Lord, the prophet's ministry. We saw Zechariah was filled with the Spirit and prophesied. And we saw Elizabeth was filled with the Spirit and prophesied. All of that was for service in the Old Testament era. So filling of the Holy Spirit has nothing to do with getting born again. It has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in you. And it has nothing to do with some a special endowment of power or whatever coming upon you whatsoever. What's the purpose of the filling of the Holy Spirit? Well, in all four cases that we already looked at in, in the Old Testament, it was for service. That's what we see. Let's look in the New Testament. Acts chapter 4. We pick up here in verse 8. Here's Peter. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost. What does that mean? Not to mean he has the Holy Spirit in him. This is the filling of the Holy Spirit for the influence of the Holy Spirit upon his life for the service of the Lord. He said unto them, You rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we be this day examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by which means he's made whole, be it known unto you all, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation, any other. There's no other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. What was Peter doing? Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, was preaching the gospel to him. This is the service of the Lord. The filling of the Holy Spirit has to do with the service of the Lord. We also see in Acts chapter 6, when the ministry, uh, the, the, the Grecians were being neglected in the daily ministration, their widows were being neglected, what did they do? They had to have someone to carry this out, this service. And so, Acts 6.3, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom that we may appoint over this business. Well, they were looking for someone who was filled with the Holy Spirit for the service of the Lord. And... Here we see in verse 5, saying, Please the whole multitude, they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Ghost. He was full of the Holy Spirit as well, as well as the rest of these ones that carried out the service of the Lord. Let's look at another case. In Acts chapter 9, 9 verse 15. This is after Saul was converted, got born again, on the way of Damascus. And the Lord said to him, Go thy way as a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles, the kings, and the children of Israel. That's his ministry. He's to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, to the kings, and also the children of Israel. I'll show him how great things he must suffer for his namesake. So Ananias went his way. He puts his hands on him. And he said, The Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, thou sent me that thou mayest receive thy sight. So he got his sight restored. And remember, he had a ministry that he was going to operate in. And be filled with the Holy Ghost. It's not talking about the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in him. Remember, that has nothing to do with it. The filling of the Holy Spirit was the service of the Lord. Because remember what he had told Ananias that he was going to be sent for. He was, he's a chosen vessel to bear my name before the Gentiles, the kings, and the children of Israel. So this was Paul being filled with the Holy Spirit for the service of the Lord in ministering to the Gentiles, the kings, and the children of Israel. We see another case in Acts chapter 11, verse 22, 23. Or, uh, in verse 24, he's talking about Barnabas here, coming here. Barnabas came forth to Antioch. He came, he saw the grace of God, was glad, exhorted them all, a purpose heart that they would cleave unto the Lord. He was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added to the Lord. Full of the Holy Ghost, 
He was being used of the Lord to serve him and to lead people to be added unto the Lord. It's talking about the filling of the Holy Spirit upon his life to bring people to the Lord to be born again. Here's another case where the filling of the Holy Spirit was involved in destroying the works of the enemy. Acts 13, verse 8. This is Paul and Silas coming in contact here. Or Barnabas and Saul, that is. In verse 7. Eliamus the sorcerer, so is his name by interpretation, withstood them. This is the deputy of the country that they were, Paul and Barnabas were bringing the gospel to. Seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith, Saul, who's also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost. That's for the influence of the Holy Spirit for the service of the Lord. Set his eyes on him. He said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, and not see in the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Ah, the filling of the Holy Spirit for the service of the Lord, uh, temporary blindness comes upon him. Verse 11, is, as he said, the, the mist and a darkness. And so he was now blind for a season. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. These guys were bringing the gospel to him for the service of the Lord. The filling of the Holy Spirit enabled him, that was the, anoint, the, the uh, influence of the Holy Spirit from a filling of the Holy Spirit, manifesting the presence of the Holy Spirit so that he spoke forth this mist of darkness upon him. And what did that do? Of course, that stopped him from hindering the deputy from hearing the gospel. The deputy believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now, the filling of the Holy Spirit we need to talk about for a moment because the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a one-time thing that occurs when we receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, we're immersed, submerged, engulfed in the presence of the Holy Spirit. The old spirit's taken out. A new spirit comes in. We're born again. It happens one time. Then the receiving of the Holy Spirit, which comes into one who believes, having the Spirit of Christ in him, now as a promise or a part of their inheritance, can receive it from the Father. The Holy Spirit is received, and that is a one-time thing. How about the filling of the Holy Spirit? It is not a one-time thing. Ephesians chapter 5. We pick up over here in verse 18. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. This is something that's very important to realize. When it says be filled with the Spirit, first of all, this is a command. It's an imperative mood. It's a command to every believer. Secondly, it is a present tense verb meaning ongoing continuous action. The way you would translate this, it would literally mean he's commanding us to be continuously being filled with the Spirit. Otherwise, it's not a one-time thing. It's supposed to happen continually. And also, it's being done by God because it's a passive voice. You can't make it happen. But you are to continually be being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a command from him that he's accomplishing this. But there is a part for you to play to see this happen. Verse 19 goes on and tells us, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. How does this filling of the Holy Spirit occur? When you praise and worship God. When you are praising and worshiping God, you are singing to the Lord, ministering to Him, but as a dual effect. You're also speaking to yourselves bringing a release of the presence of the Holy Spirit for the filling of the Holy Spirit in your life. So as you praise and worship God on a regular basis, it will bring a continuous filling of the Holy Spirit for the service of the Lord. Otherwise, filling with the Holy Spirit is ongoing, day after day after day. Acts chapter 4, verse 31, also show, shows something. Here, these guys were having a prayer meeting. 
when they prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. What was that a result of? Because of their prayer. Praying also brings a filling of the Holy Spirit. As you pray, the more you pray, the more you'll see the filling of the Holy Spirit for the service of the Lord. And what did it do? If the influence of the Lord, you can see it, because they spake the word of God with boldness. A boldness came upon them. And down in verse 33, it says, With great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon all. They were giving testimony and witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus because of this filling of the Holy Spirit, the service of the Lord. This shows us that prayer, as well as praise and worship, praying in tongues, also will bring a filling of the Holy Spirit in your life. And it's supposed to happen ongoing. What's the purpose of it for the service of the Lord? So, what have we seen here? The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the new birth, which happens when you receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. You get a brand new spirit. The old spirit's taken out. A new spirit comes in. That old spirit is burnt up. The new spirit you get is the spirit of Jesus Christ. That is not from the Father. That is from Jesus. The Spirit of Christ proceeds from Jesus, the Spirit of His Son. Then we receive the Holy Spirit as a believer in Jesus Christ. This coming from the Father, it proceeds from the Father. We receive from the Father the Holy Spirit who comes to dwell in us. It's a promise, a part of our inheritance. It belongs to us as a believer and it's called receiving the Holy Spirit. That is the second one. And then third, we have the now are to be filled with the Holy Spirit continually through praise, worship, prayer on an ongoing basis for the influence of the Holy Spirit in our life. We saw what happened in Acts chapter 2, but let's look at this same thing happening in Acts chapter 10 at Cornelius' house. Cornelius' house. Acts 10, 44, remember Peter came and spoke words about how they might be saved? Here's verse 44. Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. They got born again. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They of the circumcision believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also, after they've been born again, what's the second thing that happens? The receiving of the Holy Spirit was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in them. Well, how did they know that? For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Couldn't you speak with tongues until the Holy Spirit's in you? No. So they first got born again, then they received the Holy Spirit, and then they heard them speak with tongues. Then, can any man forbid water? This is talking about water baptism. That these should not be baptized, which have received... The Holy Ghost as well as you. This is why you know it's the receiving. Again, this same term, Lombano, receive the Holy Spirit as well as we. This also tells you something. Water baptism has nothing to do with being born again. And water baptism has nothing to do with receiving the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in you. Because these guys were born again, had the Holy Spirit, were already speaking in tongues, and then they said, can, should we forbid, can we forbid water from these ones that should be baptized? Because they already were speaking in tongues. They already had the Holy Spirit within them. Baptism with water is a declaration of what happened on the inside of us. So I trust this has given you the true understanding because we must come in line with the true doctrine <coughs> of the Holy Spirit. And here it is. There is a difference between the baptism, the receiving, and the filling of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the new birth where we come into the body of Christ, the one body, a new creation, receive the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of His Son. The old Spirit's taken out and burn up, and a new Spirit comes into us. Now God is our Heavenly Father. The second experience, the receiving of the Holy Spirit, that's where the Holy Spirit now comes to dwell in us. When we receive Him, because we're born again and we have a right to it because it's a promise of God. We receive it directly from the Father. The Father gives the Holy Spirit to us. 
And that's the my spirit of Ezekiel 20, 36, 27 that we talked about. The filling of the Holy Spirit is not a one-time event. It is a continuous event through praise and worship and prayer on an ongoing basis for the influence of the Holy Spirit in your life. So as you praise and worship and you pray, then the Holy Spirit influence will be there to influence you for the service of the Lord. That is the true doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Why doesn't everybody understand this? Because they haven't looked at all these scriptures. I trust this will help you and that you will see this truth and share this with others because the body of Christ must come to the truth. If they're going to be a part of the glorious, perfected, mighty church, it's going to be one. They need to come in line with the true doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you and praise you for this revelation. Thank you for everyone understanding the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a new birth. Receiving the Holy Spirit is where the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in us after we're born again. And the filling of the Holy Spirit is for the service of the Lord that happens continuously through praise and worship and prayer. Thank you, Father, for each one understanding this, receiving this, sharing it with others. And thank you for bringing the body of Christ into the true understanding of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit and they would come in one accord to be a part of this end-time mighty church. Father, we thank you for this revelation, and we will go forth and share it with others. Thank you for much fruit from it. In Jesus' name, amen.